Hello guys and welcome to Team 5436's The Aluminum Cobblers uh, Part 2 in the Position Tracking Mathematics Tutorial. I'm Nolan. Uh, make sure before you watch this video, you watch Part 1 of the series. Um, it should be in the uh, description below. So Part 2 of this series is going to be going over the aligned perpendicular third wheel. So in Part 1, we went over how to do these this two-wheel tracking, and today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding on a statement to this two-wheel position tracking to input data from the middle wheel into the new position of the robot. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so with this new addition to the video series, we're going to be talking about the math behind wheels that are perfectly aligned in the center of the robot and perpendicular to the two other tracking wheels that you put on your robot. In the part three, we will go over how to compensate for an offset offset wheel. Uh, and it will use all the same math, it will just need a little bit of an adjustment. So some of the prerequisites today that we're going to need to know about is so the basic prerequisites, you're going to need to know a little bit about vector addition and how you just add the components. Uh, and then you're, need to, you're going to need to know basic graphs, like nothing much about it. Just know that time on the x-axis, distance on the y-axis, and to know how to kind of match a line to it. And then uh, in the advanced section, we're going to be going over the reasoning behind some of the uh, angles that are coming up and that's going to actually require a basic integral. Don't get scared, it is calculus, uh, but I will explain the integral as I go. So it's a good intro for those of you who have, who have not had any experience in calculus yet. And you'll actually see what calculus can be used for. So now is a good time to just quickly go over what we actually are doing when we're taking data from our encoder wheels. So you're taking data every frame, and uh, you'll be updating this in the code, so they'll take a frame, and that will have a certain value, and then you'll take another frame that will have another value, and then over even here, you'll take another frame, and that will have a certain value, uh, and you're just going to keep on taking frames and update it as we go. But the question is, what happens in between that frame? So uh, if you have any of the wheels, whether it's uh, the right wheel, left wheel, or the middle wheel, uh, you start at frame one, and because we want the delta distance that each one has gone, each frame, we'll just start frame one at zero, and then we know that over a certain time, frame two happens, and uh, it goes a certain distance. And we know that distance because that's what, that's what we measure. So that would be our dr or our dl, whatever we're doing. But we actually don't know what happens in between this time because it could be going up like this, it could do that, it could do that, and go all the way and wiggle itself up that way. The thing is we don't know those points in between because we're not able to update it that fast. So the only way we can assume is that it's going in a straight line. It's the simplest path and with the straight line we know that it would actually have a constant velocity. So you could uh, create an equation or something over here that would look like, uh, the, if we say it's the left distance, we could say dl is equal to the speed, the left, or the left velocity, um, let's call it velocity left, times time, because that's the time in between frames, and that's the velocity that's going, or that's the assumed velocity. And so there's no other way to figure out what it's actually doing in between that. But luckily, these frames are so short that it won't make a difference. So if we take another look at the information that we know. we Last episode, we went over all the formulas to go for dm. And so we know all of that. So I won't even draw out the dl and dr, because we can just assume that those are there. But now we're adding this vector that ds is adding on to here. And it's important to note that no matter what ds is doing, 
DL and DR will continue to be correct for its angle values because whenever uh, the robot turns, the middle wheel won't be moving because it's perfectly aligned in the center and it won't move at all. So we have to add this vector, DS, for DS stands for distance strafe. We have to add that vector at some angle to the vector we already know, which is that known vector. But the key is we can't have it add the vector at this angle because this angle is right at the beginning and doesn't take into consideration that it's adding at a constant velocity along dm. So it's adding along all these different points infinitesimally. And so we need to find the average angle that this will go through. And uh, I'll just give it to you now. We'll go into an in-depth explanation uh, in the advanced section. But that angle is actually going to be half of the delta angle that it changes here. So this angle right here and this, ang this tangent angle right here. The difference between those angles, it's going to be half that because this tangent line is right here. So if we were actually to put that in terms of what we know, we know that that change in angle is that dr minus dl over length, that value that we got from last episode. We know that that theta value is equal to dr minus dl over l. And we'll put that in parentheses. Now, uh, that angle halfway through is just going to be equal to theta over 2. So we know that angle right here. But that's also going to be plus the initial angle because we won't always be working from a robot that starts at 0 degrees. Now, the key is that angle isn't what we want to find. That's just the tangent. And we know that this middle wheel is supposedly perfectly aligned to the center and that perfect perpendicular. So that also means that we know that this is 90 degrees this way. So to add on to that new angle there, we just subtract pi over 2. And that will give us this angle right here. So we know that we're adding the vector ds, the, mag the magnitude of ds, and an angle of this whole thing up here. And uh, since we already know that, we know that the components that's going to add to it is just going to be ds times cosine of that value. And we're going to have ds times sine of that value. And that is going to be what we want to add to those values. And this is the x component, and this is the y component. So you can add those values onto uh, each frame uh, to figure out what the wheel is doing. But Nolan, you may ask, how do you know that the average angle that the robot is over the course of a frame is equal to half of that theta value? Well, let's take a look at it. Uh, this is where we're going to need a little bit of calculus to make sure we know it. So, if we look at the graph that we looked at when we were talking about the properties of each of the deck wheels over the course of a frame, uh, this time I wrote two of the values out. So let's, in this theoretical situation, we've got dr going a certain distance that's farther than dl, but we both know that they're going at a constant rate because we have no other option except to assume that. So uh, once we've done that, let's try to actually find a function for theta over time in that frame. So, or theta of time, put it like that. So we know that that uh, whole thing, that whole 
equation dr minus dl divided by length. But let's put dr in terms of something else. dr is equal to the velocity r times time. Right, we know that because we're it's just a constant. And dl time equals the velocity r times time. And so these velocities, we have no clue what they are, but we can just assume them to be, uh, so now we know that we can plug this in, vr times time minus vl times time. And this whole value divided by l. And so you guys see how that's equivalent to dr minus dl over length. And that's going to give us that theta value. So now we actually have a way to figure this out. Uh, so if we simplify that out, theta of t is equal to velocity r minus velocity l divided by l. And then let's make that entire quantity times t. Times t. And the reason I formatted it like this is to show you guys that if vr is a constant for the frame and vl is a constant for the frame divided by l and then l is a constant for the frame this entire value is going to be a constant and when you have a constant times time that is just a linear equation it's it's your y equals mx plus b it's your line and just your most basic simple equation. So let's put this over here for a second and we know that. So now we can say that theta is just a normal line like this. So if we back up on this stuff so we can have a blank slate, let's just now say that we can calculate this theta. So this is our theta divided by time. Oops, sorry. This is our theta of time. So what we need to know is we need to know what that average angle is that it sweeps. And this is where calculus gets involved. So now because we know this now we now know this function theta of t uh, is linear, we'll actually assume that the average is the value on this uh, on this graph as well, and we'll name that average point right here. And remember, we know this point up here is just the theta value, uh, which is the dr minus dl over l. And down here, we'll actually call time finals, the time that it is at the end of the frame. Uh, and we know it starts at zero here, and because we're working in delta distances here, We'll start at a distance of zero up here. So, one of the important things to know is that if we draw a straight line across the, gra the graph that is equal to the average along here, the uh, the area under this curve, this average uh, rectangle, will be equal to the area under this theta of t curve here. In fact, just to make that clear, you guys, I'll put it in a different color. So the area under this curve as well. So if we put that numerically, we actually know that the average, whatever that average value times uh, t final nice zero, and make sure that that goes in parentheses there, is equal to whatever the area of that theta of t value is. And so uh, let's go through it. Since it's a triangle there, you can actually put that average average of t, and we'll just get rid of the zero there, because we know that that will just be t final. The area will be 1 half, or let's just put 0.5, times, since it goes up here, that's the height, so it's theta minus zero, let's put that in there, 
times again uh, t final minus oh, minus zero, and we put that in parentheses too. And we can just simplify that down so that the zero we get rid of the zeros because those don't matter. And t final. Now, uh, if we just divide both sides by t final, we actually get that the average is equal to 0 0.5 times theta. And that's the theta value, that's dr minus dl over l. And so you can see here that the average angle that the uh, robot is at over each frame is just going to be 0 0.5 times theta, or average equals theta over 2. And so that's how we know that the average angle that it sweeps is equal to half of that delta angle. Okay, so now that we've gone ahead and figured out exactly what the what components of the vector uh, ds is adding, let's take a look at this. So this is what we came up with in part one. This is how to track the two wheels. And let's go ahead and add the components that belong here. So uh, we figured out that the cone for the x is you're just going to add ds times cosine of um, the initial angle plus uh, pi over 2 because of that, that 90 degree angle. And, or actually, no, I apologize, minus pi over 2 because it's at the 90 degree angle backwards. And then you're going to add the theta value, that theta value divided by 2. Let's expand this a little bit. And uh, that theta div value divided by 2 is what we've been looking to prove this entire uh, video. And we'll just go ahead and add that onto the y value, because we're just adding the vector. But instead, we'll change that to the sine of that angle. And this is what you're going to add once you have that third middle wheel. And actually what we'll realize is that when we go to look at a offset wheel, we're just going to be looking at how to find ds for a perfectly perpendicular wheel based on a offset wheel. That's how we'll do it. And it's important to note angle stays the same because no matter what, the middle perfectly aligned wheel in the center will not change what the angle value is. It always depends on the left and the right wheel. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Hopefully it was helpful. Uh, thank you guys for watching it again. Make sure you like and subscribe this, to this video. And make sure you stay safe for part three. Uh, that will be coming out in about a week. So make sure you stay tuned. Hopefully uh, you've learned something out of this. Bye.